Good evening. Good evening. It is once again good to be back. Tonight is the last night of our gospel meeting. I don't know about you, but I think we ought to just go ahead and extend it and tell Jonathan he has to be back here tomorrow and Friday and Saturday too. I'm sure he can figure out a few more things to preach to us, right? Yeah, there's not a chapter six. <laughs> <laughs> just start right back over. Go back to chapter one. Uh, it has been a, a good week. We have learned a tremendous amount, uh, and you can't get a better study than the book of James. And Jonathan has done an excellent job presenting that to us. I'm sure that tonight as he finishes up his, his, his study on looking at the chapter 5, that he will do another excellent job. If you have missed one of the lessons, do remember that they are being live streamed to Facebook. They're recorded and they stay on Facebook. And tonight or tomorrow morning, the lessons will be uploaded to YouTube as well. So anyone who wants to uh, go back and watch will be able to. <clears throat> do appreciate everyone being here. Uh, you know, we've had several visitors. I do believe this might be the first time I've ever seen a, a speaker bring guests to the extent which Jonathan has. He has had two to three guests with him every night, and that, that's wonderful. We're, we're definitely glad he was able to bring uh, friends with him as well. But thank you for all that you've done, and let's give our attention to Jonathan. Before I begin the sermon, I do want to just go ahead and tell you guys again how much I appreciate you all. How much all of you have meant to us and really impacted my family this week. Um, our boys are tired, beyond tired, and, and I was speaking with somebody today, and, and this is the first gospel meeting I've ever preached. Another preacher friend of mine called me, and we were talking, and, and I said, yeah, I said, I'll tell you what. I said, I'm tired. I said, but it is a good tired. It, and I couldn't think of a better way to be exhausted than after spending a week enriching souls. It's a blessing for me to be able, be able to even serve in this capacity. Uh, the fact that I have that privilege, I want to thank you for that. Because that is, is all because of you. And, and without you, it wouldn't have happened. Thank you so much. We look at the title of our lesson tonight, Keep Holding On. This is something that you and I have probably heard quite a bit in our lives or even just in the past couple years. Keep holding on. Seems as if times present themselves where we get to the end of our rope and there's nothing else to hold on to. Seems like sometimes life, circumstances, or trials present themselves and it's all that we can do to keep holding on. It's hard, isn't it? Life is sometimes difficult. The passage in James chapter 5, verses 7 through 12, is going to give us comfort. This is going to give us comfort in, in the days to come. And I thought, what a wonderful way to end off a gospel meeting than to tell you some words of encouragement to give you some oomph in the fight. Sometimes that's all we need, isn't it? Sometimes that's all we need is for somebody to say to keep on keeping on. It's sometimes hard to do that, but in times of encourage or in times of hardship, that encouragement is going to be a necessity. James would encourage them and he would tell them in, in seventh or 12 and this is an encouragement but also a warning he wants them to realize the severity here be patient therefore brethren unto the coming of the lord behold the husbandman waiteth for the uh, precious fruit of the earth now when it says a husbandman here this is talking about a farmer and he says he's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until the lord until the until he received the early and latter rain now we look at that and we think about it and I want to stop there for just a moment and talk about receiving the early and latter rain. What are we saying? He says, be patient, brothers, unto the coming 
of the Lord. Now, would this be in the context of the Lord returning to receive his church? Or would this be in the context of something else, maybe through the midst of trial? I'd like to believe the latter, but either one could be so. So as we go through this, I want us to understand whether we're waiting on the Lord to come back or we're simply just having endurance during the time we are waiting for the trial to end. This is all going to be happening. Again, I like to think that this is talking about trials because of the way that the book begins. He, was, he would end it off in chapter 5 telling them also, that when trials present themselves, when the coming of the Lord, that means the end of their persecution, that these people, these early Christians were having to go through, when this ends, it'll all be worth it all. Remember, the latter end was better than the beginning when Job, when concerning Job. Now look at this, it says, Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draws near. Be patient, establish your heart. The coming of the Lord draws near. Grudge not one against another, brethren. Drudge not one against another. And then he says, lest ye be condemned. So it's a warning while also an encouragement. Behold, the judge stands before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the, day of, uh, in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering and affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. We count them happy which endure. Remember James chapter 1 and verse 2? Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. That word pitiful means that he cares for you. He is very full of pity for you and of tender compassion. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Here's the end all be all, lest ye fall into condemnation. Sounds to me like he may be trying to get us all to realize are trying to get them all, those who are scattered abroad, to realize that there was a, a cost, that condemnation to them falling away, but to keep holding on in the midst of their persecution. Because one day we'll be able to count it as a blessing that we've been persecuted. You and I can count it as a blessing one day when we can say before God that yes, Lord, I have endured for your sake, but here I am. Here I am. The first part that we need to note this one evening is going to be wait on the Lord. And I'm going to talk a little bit just in the text about how we are to wait upon the Lord. In verse 7, it says, Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waits for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience. So you and I are going to have to wait patiently for the coming of the Lord or for the end of our trial, whatever it be, the, the, the second coming of Jesus or the end of our persecution that we may be going through. Regardless or whatever the case may be, patience is involved and it's going to be needed in the midst of waiting. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 18 expresses a thought here and I want you to hang your hat for a moment because I want to talk to you. Sometimes waiting can be hard. Sometimes waiting is not always fun. And even in circumstances we become to get him or we begin to get angry. Proverbs 15 and verse 18 says, A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. You and I are not going to be who we need to be if we're walking around upset all the time. Or as I call it in the moly girls. We can't be affected if we're upset and grumbling all the time. And that's, that's part of it later and I don't want to step ahead of myself, but we've got to be patient. 
1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4, if we're going to show love to others, if we're going to be the example God wants for us to be, that great love chapter says that love suffers long. Charity suffers long and is kind. Not angry, but patient and kind. In the midst of our trial, we cannot afford to lose it. I can't afford to give up. How many of us have said, I'm about to lose my religion? We've said it. We may have even said it. We may have even said, I'm about to lose my cool. I can't take it anymore. Heather and I had a hard first year of marriage. Very hard. A lot of things presented themselves uh, and, and thankfully we loved each other through it. And we made it. Nine years together. Such a blessing. And, and we, we had a hard time. But over and over, love. Love. Love conquered all of it. Love was what got us through every bit of it. Every circumstance that might have presented itself, it didn't ever compare to the love that we had for each other. Does your love for God compare? And, and, I, and I say for God after talking about me and Heather because this relationship we have as Christians is a marriage. That we are, we are the bride of Christ. And does your love for Christ trump your desire to just lose it? See, I mean, sometimes we want to, don't we? Sometimes we want to just let go and lose it and lose all matter. But Paul would tell the Philippians, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. Our reputation is at hand. And His reputation is at hand. Nobody's going to want to be a Christian if we're no different than anybody else. If they don't see the change or the difference in us and the way we respond to circumstance or trial, what example are we showing them? Not a godly one. Patience. But then in verse 8, be ye also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draws near. Steadfastness. We need to be steadfast. We need to make sure that we're never stopping. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58, Paul would say, be ye steadfast and unmovable. Unmovable, Christian. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Never stopping. Why? So that your work that you're doing is not found in vain in the Lord. That's what Paul would want them to understand is that vanity is not going to be able to be acceptable in the presence of God when we stand before Him. The coming of the Lord draws nigh. The end of your circumstance might draw nigh. So keep going. Keep on keeping on. Remember when you were in gym class in school, maybe you were even an athlete, maybe running a race and it began to get fatigued or tired near the end of the race, but all you could think about in the back of your mind and all you could see in your head is the finish line and it kept helping you to go and to go and to go. And instead of just worrying about how much longer you had, you began to say, I can do it for one more second. I can do it for just one more second. Anybody can do something for one second, can't they? So give me one more second. Give me one more second. Lord, help me get one more. Lord, help me go through this circumstance one more day at a time. One day, Lord. That's how you and I should respond. Steadfastly and unmovable. That means that the devil, no matter how much he has against us, he can't budge us. Yeah. And if we don't realize that that is what's going to take it's going to take us standing up and not being able to be moved. Psalm 1 would talk about a tree that's planted by the rivers of water that gives forth fruit and its season in all seasons. Its leaf also shall not wither. Why is that? Because it is connected to the source. Steadfastness 
would imply that you and I have to be connected. Patience in the midst of trial would imply that you and I have to be connected to the source. And so are our roots deep enough? Are you planted where you need to be planted? And getting the nutrients that you need to get because otherwise you only have yourself to blame. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. We have to have a desire, but that desire produces something. Once we get into the word, growth takes place. Our roots get deeper and gets down to the source and keeps us connected. Have you ever seen a palm tree after the storm? The buildings, the places around the, the, the storm, maybe the hurricane has just wreaked havoc upon the town, but the, plant, the, the palm tree is still planted. Why? Because its roots are deep enough. Because it's, it, it, it might get bent beneath the weight of the storm, but at the end of the storm, it stands back up. Keep holding on. And not grumbling. Verse 9. Drudge not, lest you, uh, drudge not one against another, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge stands before the door. <laughs> this one, I remember, I thought about this, and, and, and anybody who's a parent um, or, or an aunt or an uncle or has children nearby who they've taken to uh, the Walmart in town and stood in line understands what I'm talking about. Maybe the, the person in front of you is taking a little too long and the kid's getting impatient and they begin to grumble. What's taking so long? Or is this ever going to end? Can we ever just leave this place? Mama, when is it going to stop? In the midst of our trial, no grumbling. We're children of God. We need to understand that it might take some time. But just because it's not on my time does not mean God's not going to be on time when it takes place. He was four days late for Lazarus, but guess what? He was right on time. In the midst of our circumstance, no grumbling. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 says, Do all things without murmurings and disputings. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9 says, Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Let's talk about endurance. I want to talk about, we talked about waiting, but there's something else that we have to do. We have to be, produce endurance within us. There's going to be something that's built. There's a reason that we're waiting. Sometimes there's a reason that we're waiting. Endurance is built during this time. Considering Job, if you look at the first verse, as we talked about last night, it, be, it, it explained him as a man that lived in us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect. That man was complete and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Yet what do we read about thereafter? That God allowed Satan to tempt Job over and over by doing what? By literally destroying every area of the man's life to the point where he said, you can do anything you want to, but don't take his life from him. Anything you want, but don't take his life. At the end of the book of Job, we read that the latter end was better than the beginning because Job was patient. My grandmother used to tell me, don't ever pray for patience. If you, if you pray for patience, then the Lord's going to give you opportunities to use those patience. I think that was kind of foolish, but in a way that's kind of funny, right? We think about that. Yes, God doesn't necessarily just miraculously bestow patience upon an individual. Neither does He give us strength like that, but He gives us opportunities to use that strength and opportunities to exercise those patience. Opportunity. That's what presents itself because nothing's free. There's no such thing as a free lunch, right? 
there's always a catch. There's always something that God wants us to do. He wants us to see something here that there's going to be growth in the midst of. Jesus. In, Matthew, in John, I'm sorry, John chapter 12, verses 27 and 28, it says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Listen to his expression here. Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. While he's asking God to save him from the hour, he also understands that he's here for a reason. That there's a purpose behind this, sir, this situation. And I always think about Jacob here. Right here. Jacob, when he wrestled with the man, he wrestled all night long until the breaking of the day. And at the breaking of the day, the man said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let you go except thou bless me. Jacob kept holding on all night long and he wrestled with the man with his leg out of joint and did not give up and showed the perseverance of a lifetime <laughs> because he knew it didn't happen for no reason. Now, I'm going to get something out of this. What are you going to get, Jacob? A new name. His name was changed from Jacob, deceiver, to Israel, which means prince with God. What a change in the name, right? He said, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. That's what Jesus said. For this cause came I unto this hour. I know that there's purpose here, Lord. But I, I don't want to do it, but I know that there's purpose. John 12 and verse 28 says, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. If I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. Endurance in the waiting. He understood the, the, the price that was going to have to be paid. He knew it, but he said, nevertheless, not mine, but yours. Not my will, but yours be done. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12 tells us the reason here. He says, there was one sacrifice that was offered for sins forever. He had that. That was the purpose in Jesus' enduring what was he waiting on? Well, in Hebrews chapter 12, we see, well, in chapter 1, in chapter 12, we see he sits at the right hand of the throne of God. We see that he's there. Talk about Paul. And I love this one. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I know I have Philippians 3, 13 and 14. He talks in Philippians 3, 13 and 14, just to sum it up, he's saying there, I, I, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. He doesn't give up. There's endurance and he's keeping on. But 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verses 24 through 27, he says, Know you not that they which run in a race run all. Now going back to that race I was talking about, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain it. In the midst of your trial, in the midst of this race that you're running, Christian, just run so that you might be a, the, the winner of the race. That you may obtain it, the prize. And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown, one that cannot be fade, that cannot fade away. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly so fight I, not as the one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection, lest by any means that I myself might become a castaway. When we fight against temptation, we are fighting so that you and I can maintain the course. We don't need to run off course. We need to stay in our lane and keep going toward the prize. I will also, I often bring up 
I heard an old preacher one time talk about putting mule, putting blinders on an old mule so that he'll go in a straight line and not get distracted left or right. We need to put on our spiritual blinders and keep focused upon the Father. Because that's where we're headed. We're headed to that home in heaven. That place of eternal rest. But the only way we'll ever find that eternal rest is if we do what God's asked us to do. So maintain your endurance. Keep going in the midst of your trial. And then lastly, the reward in the waiting. There is a reward in waiting. And that's the beauty of this whole thing. Is that not only do I have peace while I'm here on earth, with God about, I can't tell you the peace that I had. I can't explain it and I often try to, but I grew up, uh, I guess, in church my whole life. And I say it for that, that way for a reason because I, I grew up around zealous people my entire life. But until I did what the Bible told me to do, simply just taking the word at face value and obeying it, it was only then that I was able to go home and rest my lay my head down on my pillow and not fear death. Thank God. I don't have to be afraid because I did what God know what God has told me to do and I knew it. I had so much peace when I laid my head down that, that night and I remembered not having to be afraid if I were to die in the middle of the night. I would often pray, God, if I'm not saved, Lord, save my soul so that if I die in the middle of the night, God, that I'll be with you. I did that over and over and over in my life foolishly thinking that that's what it took, but until I just looked into Scripture and began to obey the words within, I had no peace. But when I began to do it, there was peace. It wasn't until the obedience that peace presented itself. <laughs> peace is something that you and I can have not only here, but there. The reward. There's also sanctification. Sanctification and, and we're made right before God and, and, and we're because of what Jesus did. Now look at Jane, uh, at John. Chapter 17. Verses 6 through 17. His prayer for his disciples. Listen to this. He's talking to the Father. He says, I manifested thy name unto the men that thou hast give, uh, that thou gavest me out of the world. Thou, uh, thine they were, and thou gavest them to me, that they, uh, and they kept, they, they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things of all, uh, whatsoever you have given me are of thee. I have, for I have given unto them the words which thou gave me, and they received them and have known surely. And I came out of you, and, and, and they have believed that you did send me. Listen, he's going to bat. You see what Jesus is doing here for his disciples? He is the mediator. He's being that mediator between God and man. What a blessing. He's going to bat for them to the Father. And that's exactly what he does at the right hand of the Father for us today. What a blessing. Sanctify them with truth. Thy word is truth. That's how we're going to be made clean. It's by looking in, in, into God's Word, by seeing it for what it is and by obeying it. Doing what it says for us to do. If you love me, keep my commandments. John chapter 14 and verse 15. And I, I call you my friend if you do what I ask you to do. If, 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 if you do what I say. John chapter 15 and verse 14. We see the reward. And it's so that our work is not found in vain. 
Uh, I've already mentioned this verse, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, about being steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. This is the part right here. For as much as we know that our labor, our work, is not in vain. It's not found in vain in the Lord. Vain emptiness. So that the work that I'm doing is for a reason, for a purpose. Don't you want the work that you're doing for the kingdom of God to be done with purpose and for a purpose? Then do what you're what was told there in the beginning. Be steadfast, Christian, unmovable, abounding in the work. Looking always for every opportunity that you can to serve. <laughs> And of course, so that his work was not in vain. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. I'm dead with Christ. I've been well, crucifixion at that time. He's talking to people who understood this. You and I, have, none of us probably in this building have ever witnessed a crucifixion. I would dare say that we have. He's talking to people who understood the severity. It was the worst punishment that one could receive. I'm crucified with Christ. I'm that living sacrifice that we read about in Romans chapter 12. Nevertheless, I live. I'm dead with Christ, but I, I'm alive. I'm more alive than I've ever been. Yet not I, because it's not me that lives. It's Christ that lives within me. And that life that I live now is not about Jonathan anymore. It's about Jesus. The life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and He gave Himself for me. I am going to wait because the reward in waiting is... If, if I don't wait, if I, if I give up right now in the midst of my trial or, or before the Lord comes back, if I give up and I throw it all away, then Jesus' sacrifice for me was useless if I don't do what I'm supposed to do. I have to hold up my end of the bargain here. I can't go before God expecting Him to just go off of what Jesus did. I have to show Him also what I've done. We do. There's an expectation on behalf of myself as well that I maintain that cleanliness. If we walk in the light, there's that condition. I have to walk in it to have that fellowship one with another. To have that continual cleansing that Jesus is talking about there, that, that cleansing that keeps on cleansing as long as I'm, as verse 9 says, continuing to confess when I mess up and continuing to try to jump back on track. Even though I mess up, I have that confidence in, in Jesus' blood if I'm in the light. That condition. I need to make sure that His work is not found in vain. That, that, I, that he didn't do it just for nothing. No, I want to be standing there and say, yes, I, I understand, Lord. That his work, that everything that he did, that that sacrifice on behalf of my sake, on, for me, Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want to make sure that I'm not just expecting something for free. And of course, when we when we do all of this, we're going to receive a crown. In, uh, Tim, in, in 2 Timothy, Paul would tell him about the crown. He said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course and I kept the faith. Notice that. Have you ever thought the wording of that was a little interesting i fought a good fight i finished my course and i kept the faith and when i first read that I, and, and really thought about it i thought shouldn't i say i finished the course i finished the course last you know because that's the finish line you, you expect finish to be in the last part of that no because i fought a good fight and i finished my course because i kept the faith that's how we that's how we finish otherwise it's unfinished it's abandoned unless we keep the faith i fought a good fight i finished my course and i kept the faith henceforth 
There's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, but not to me only. Amen. And thank God that you and I can have the same confidence Paul had if we will fight the good fight and finish our course by keeping the faith. There will be a crown of righteousness laid up for you and me. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that if I just live that faithful life, Re Revelation chapter 2 says, if I live faithful unto death, I will receive that crown of life. I don't know if I'm going to wear it or if I'm going to lay it at His feet. But all I know is that I'm going to receive one if I keep the faith. And for that, I am so thankful. For that, I, I, I praise God every day to know that there's laid up for me that there's an anticipation for me to be with my Savior eternally. A reward in the way. And if for no other reason, if sanctification isn't good enough, if it's not a good enough reason to know that you, you didn't work for nothing and that He didn't work for nothing, and that there's a crown that's waiting on you, then do it because there's an eternal life at stake. John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Notice it says should not, not shall not. Should not perish. That means He did it for us and it's up to us to make sure we maintain the goal. We shouldn't perish, but it doesn't mean we won't. Hey, if we don't finish the course, we've abandoned it. And there will be no reward. So keep holding on, Christian. Keep holding on. And, and go back to the book of James. Remember the book of James. Read it often. Allow it to minister to you. And, you know, meditate on it. Really dig into it. I promise you, you can do it for... I, I've, I've only been a Christian now for five years. But every time I read the book of James, I come away more and more enriched. That's not the only book in the Bible. Read it. The book was written. The whole book. Genesis to Revelation. To show you the love that God has for His people and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. I pray that this, that, that this meeting has been a blessing to you all. I pray that we walk away enriched, strengthened, encouraged. But if you're here this evening in need of anything, I'm going to finally... The last time I get to extend an invitation here. This is the last time I get to see you. But if if you don't come forward tonight and there's something that's hindering your walk with God, please don't wait till it's too late. You can call David, I'm sure, at any time in the night. He'd be there for you. We do this because we love him. We do this because we love you we love Him. I pray that you are who God wants you to be. And in the midst of circumstance, no matter what it is or whatever bring, whatever life throws at you, I pray for you that you'll turn back to His Word to be encouraged. To keep on holding on. If you're here this evening and you need to respond, whatever the case may be, if you have never obeyed the Gospel, I pray that you'll do that as well. I give this invitation. You have to hear the word, believe it, repent of a life you know isn't pleasing to God, confess Him as the Son of God and be baptized into Christ to live faithfully unto death. That beautiful plan right there given to us within the inspired Word allows for us to come into relationship with Him. And if we live faithful unto death, surely we will see Him and be with Him eternally. That's the hope. And I pray that you would take every opportunity to receive what's been given to you by Jesus Christ. If there's a need tonight, then please come as together we stand and as we sing. Yeah.
Oh, sir,